Thanks for joining us today at City Life. We believe today's message will empower you and point you towards Jesus. But remember that church is so much more than a message you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life, in person or online. Greater things have yet to come. Greater things are still to be done. celebrating 30 years as a church and to be honest like as we were preparing talking about this in staff I thought I don't know I don't even know if I want to celebrate this year <laughs> I, I'm gonna say what some of you are thinking it, it's like this does not feel like a season of celebration of life right now it feels like I, it feels like a dirge like it, it a funeral like just a, like a lament like it, it's like we need to just like have a like a, a sad poetry service or something. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, the, in the Bible, Israel had feasts and festivals that were actually not optional for participation. If you, if you didn't participate in them, you were kicked out of the country. Like that's... You really were. <laughs> how's that for an attendance program? <laughs> and uh, there was... It, it, this is what made you part of Israel, is that you gathered for these feasts and you gathered for these festivals. And these, these were designed to draw people together to celebrate the common origin and the experience of the people. It was to unify the country together. Now, this is an attempt. There's no, there's no like, newspapers. There's no TV. It's like, how did you, how did you bring people together so everybody was, was living the same experience? Well, the festivals and the feasts and they were they were to keep the story of God alive of what God had done and draw the collective attention to the nation to to God's faithfulness and in difficult times you know it's so easy to get our focus just narrowed down to ourself isn't it I mean we, we've had two years of just like a lot of navel gazing to be honest like in our own lives I know in my life because well because we, we had to and uh, it, the, it's easy to lose our place in the bigger story of what God is doing. True. And so the festivals, the feasts, they were designed to bring people together so they could get themselves re-centered in God's story. Yeah. And I believe, it's, I believe it's more important than ever right now that our, we're making sure our story is connected to God's story. And that we're, we're re-centering, we're getting ourselves re-centered in God in this season. And, you know, each of the feasts, just a brief summary, that it's, you know, each of the feasts told a different part of the story of God. And, we're, you know, we're familiar, we just celebrated um, a, a massive holiday in our, in our culture, Easter, but that, would, that actually lines up to the Jewish feast of Passover, yeah, right. which was when the angel of death uh, passed over over the Israelites in Egypt, and it, it's a it's a feast marking. It's a celebration of God delivering the nation of Israel from bondage, from slavery, and bringing them into the to the land of promise. And there's a, there's a, the feast of unleavened bread, which is a, a feast. It's right after Passover, and it's to recognize the corrupting influence of sin in our hearts and in our lives and they would go they would literally go through their whole house and sweep out every bit of yeast every wow. bread all the you know anything that had leaven in it anything that had yeast in it they got it out and it was just a it was a reminder that you the world's ways have a way of like leavening us corrupting us and it was just to to remember and then there was the first fruit the feast of weeks which is pentecost and the uh, the feast of booths uh, which is the ingathering of the harvest, and and it was to, it was the everywhere from the first signs of harvest to celebrating the, the the bringing in of the feast of booths to bring in the entire harvest, and it re just reminds us to bring the first fruits to God, and it also reminds us to thank Him yeah. at the end for what He's done. And uh, you know, it's interesting is the Book of Joel, the the Book of Joel was written at the Feast of Pentecost. And it was a, in a year of absolute famine. And they had gathered together for, for, to, to celebrate Pentecost, except the land had been 
ravaged by locusts four times in the growing season. And it literally says there was no grain, there was no barley, there were no grapes, there were no pomegranates, there were no apples, there were no figs, there were no olives. They're in famine and they're dying. And they're, how's that for a feast of Pentecost? We're going to celebrate the harvest. Oh, wait, there is none. So what did Joel do? I declare a holy fast. <laughs> whether you want to or not. <laughs> but he says, I'm going to declare it holy. Well, God told him to declare it holy. Fast because there's no food. But then this is where the prophecy comes out. Joel 2.25, I will compensate you for the years that the locusts have eaten. So good. And uh, it would be a great verse right now just to pin yeah. on your fridge. I will compensate you. These last two years have a lot of loss. Yeah. I will compensate you. For the year, for the years that the, that the locusts have eaten. And then this is in verse 28. This is where the promise of the Holy Spirit is given. And it said, you're, this is where Peter stood up and said, you know, your old men, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. This came out, it's a, that's, a, that's a reference to the book of Joel where in this holy fast, Joel gets up and says, the Lord says, I will pour out my Holy Spirit and it will heal the land and it will heal you. And this is where the hardest, the, the darkest time is, is where the greatest prophecy yes. that was that became the fulfillment in Acts chapter, Acts chapter two. And, and uh, we, this is, you know, this is why we feast. This is why we gather is because this gets us back in the story of God. Yes. This gets us back in in the story of why we have, and if we don't gather, if we don't have the feasts, if we don't have the festivals, we lose God in our story. Right, wow. We lose God in our story, and we lose, or maybe better to say, we lose our place in God's story. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then all we have left is Egypt's story to fall back on, and that's a story of slavery and bondage and fear. And so as we pass the 30-year mark, we're going to have a feast. Yes, we are. And we're going to have a celebration. But we are also going to remind ourselves of our place in God's story. Because God's story doesn't stop just because we had a year of famine or two years of famine. God's story continues. And in the midst of famine, there's promise. There's a promise that God will pour out his Holy Spirit. He will restore the years that the, that the locust has eaten. And so 30 is also a significant number. Yes, it is. Do you want to tell us about the significance of 30? It's a very, you know what, in the Bible, numbers are very significant. And um, numbers have meaning. The number seven is the number of wholeness or perfection. The number five is the number of grace. The number 40 is the number of testing. You see a lot of incidences where there was, there was testing in the desert. Jesus was tested for 40 days. And the Israelites had wandered in the desert for 40 years. Well, what 30 means, how many want to know what 30 means? This is good. 30 symbolizes dedication. It's a dedication to a particular task or calling. And usually, and 30 was the number of choice because it represented you are coming into an age to be able to handle more responsibility. That's a good one. I like that. But in the Old Testament, the priests were dedicated at age 30. Men entered military. They went, into, they went into the military when they were 30 years old. There were a lot of different significant people or significant um, things that happened at the age of 30 for people. David was set in as king at age 30. Joseph entered Pharaoh's court at age 30. The New Testament church, get this, started in AD 30. Isn't that cool? Acts chapter 2. But both John the Baptist and Jesus' ministry started at 30. So let's sit for a minute. And, you know, I believe, I really believe, and just I had taken, like, earlier, early in the like, last month, I just taken some time away and was just really, God, what do you have for us over this coming, you know, we're going into not just a new season, we're going into a new place, a new stage as a church. And what does this actually mean for us? And there's just, I'm just going to drop, I'm just going to put, share with you what God has just put in our hearts for that. And, you know, I really believe this invitation to a whole new dedication and what that actually means, this is an invitation I think God is extending to us. 
He's extending to every single one of us, not only, not only as individuals, but extending to us corporately. And I just want to read, I want to read the, the example of John the Baptist and Jesus. And this is from John 1, 29 to 31. And it says, the very next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and yelled out, here he is, God's Passover lamb. He forgives the sins of the world. This is the man I've been talking about, the one who comes after me, but is really ahead of me. Now look at this next thing he says. I knew nothing about who he was, only this, that my task has been to get Israel ready to recognize him as the God revealer. That's why I came here baptizing with water, giving you a good bath and scrubbing you from your, your scrubbing sins from your life so that you can get a fresh start with God. You know, and here it was, John the Baptist, Jesus' own cousin, and he knew Jesus to a certain point. But he also said, I knew nothing about who he was. Right. My task was this, to get Israel ready. For 30 years, everyone say 30 years. 30 years. For 30 years, John would have known who Jesus was. He had been faithful in carrying out his task, what God had commissioned him to do. But now, John's ministry was making way for one that was greater than him. One that would reveal who God was, that God's kingdom was coming to earth, and the way he was going to reveal it was through signs and wonders and miracles. And now applying this to us, I really believe this 30 years, we've known Jesus to a certain degree. And for a, for a bit, I'm talking to city life here. So you know what? If you're a guest, this can pertain to you too. Because if you like what you see, if you're watching online, you like what you see, you can be a part of this. <laughs> so this is for all of us. But you know what? We've, been, uh, we've known Jesus to a certain degree. We've been obedient. We've been carrying out our task. But I believe God is giving us an invitation to step into 30 the way Jesus stepped into 30. Revealing God's kingdom come to earth with signs and wonders and miracles and things like we have not yet seen. And you know what? That might seem like a really bold ask, but it's actually what Jesus told us. Actually what he promised us. Fast forward to the end of Jesus' ministry, John 14, 12. This is what Jesus said. This is one of the last messages he had with his disciples before he went to the cross. And Jesus said, the person who trusts me will not only do what I'm doing, but even greater things. Can you say greater things? Greater things. Because I, on my way to the Father, am giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. You can count on it. Man, that verse came alive for me in the last couple months. Greater thing, this is, it almost sounds like heresy to say that you're going to do greater things than what Jesus did. But that's exactly what he's saying. The person who trusts me will not only do what I'm doing, what did Jesus do? He healed the sick. He brought hope. He brought provision where there was lack. He met the needs of people. He set people free that were oppressed. He set people free that were demonized. He raised the dead. Man, that would be cool to see. I want to see some miracles. You know what? But that, it does. It sounds crazy to say, man, are we going to believe for that? But I actually believe that Jesus is giving us that invitation. Because that's what marked his ministry. So, five things I believe God is calling us to as we enter this new 30-year mark. And this is for us as a church. Number one, the first thing I believe he's calling us to is a new dedication. And just that whole the symbolism of 30 being that number of dedication. And, you know, another great example of this, John 1, 35. This is John continuing on with, in, in what had happened on the next day. John was back at his post with two disciples who were watching. He looked up, saw Jesus walking by and said, here he is, God's Passover lamb. The two disciples heard him and went after Jesus. Jesus looked over his shoulder and said to them, what are you after? And they said, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he replied, come along and see for yourself. And you know, this, the two, what are you seeking? What are you really looking for? And Jesus, all he gave them was come along and see. He gave them no, he gave them real no. Here's the game plan. Here's what you can expect. He just said, come and see. Come and see. 
And church, I think that's an invitation for us. Are you willing to come and see? Can we have that kind of dedication where we just, we want to be wherever Jesus is at. We are willing to just go all in with Jesus. No plan. They were willing to risk just to be with him. And in verse 39, it says it was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they met Jesus. They came and they saw where he was staying, but they got more than they imagined. You know, that's what God does. Yet when we really dedicate ourselves to follow him, not just being attenders, but when we really dedicate ourselves to being apprentices, followers of Jesus, man, they look at this. They remained with him for the rest of the day, and they followed him for the rest of their lives. And I think that's what God is calling us to, is, is moving into this all in, no more watching, off the sidelines in our coming, off the sidelines in our faith, off the sidelines, not just being watchers, but being all in and being those that really follow Jesus. That's good. That's good. Um, this is still you. It's still you. I thought you had some such. Oh, I just, I, I, <laughs> you know, you don't have to. commitments that we make in difficult times. They're actually a lot more substantial than ones we make when emotions are high, and I think this this oper- this time gives us an opportunity to really make deep rooted commitments, yes. like to to say we're going to be you know, to to say that we're going to have a new dedication or that we're going to be all in. It's there. It's a, it's a more substantial commitment when your emotions don't back yeah. your decisions. Yeah. But when you just, yes. this is the right way to go. This is the right, this is the way forward. And I, this is the decision to make. And I think we have an opportunity in this season to do that. Here's the second thing I believe God is inviting us to, a new confidence and trust. The first recorded miracle that Jesus performed was really interesting. It was where his, they're at a wedding. Jesus is there with his disciples and his mom. <laughs> and Mary she comes to Jesus, and they've, they have run out of wine at the wedding. If you're familiar with the story, maybe you heard it in Sunday school or wherever, but they, they, the master ceremonies, they, they come, uh, we've run out of wine. This is an embarrassment. This is terrible. And somehow Mary hears about it, and she knows Jesus enough, even though he's not done a miracle that we know of yet, but she knows he's got the power to do something supernatural. And so she says, Jesus, come on, there's something here. You know, here's an opportunity. And Jesus responds with, this isn't my time. Don't push me. (laughs) Jesus said no to his mom, asking him for a miracle. So if you've asked God for a miracle and you didn't get it, Jesus said no, but Mary didn't stop. She went ahead anyway, telling the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. What kind of attitude, what kind of faith, what kind of expectancy actually sees supernatural miracles It's the kind that says she went ahead anyway and she just got things ready as if he was going to come through. Her confidence is what moved God to do the miraculous. And she had confidence because she knew Jesus intimately. There was nobody else on earth that knew Jesus as as, as intimately as Mary did. And it was that intimacy that she had with him. And man, church, you know what? I really believe that there are signs and wonders and miracles that God is preparing for us to partner with him and be a part of and seeing doing. And I guess the question I have for us is, is something for everyone. We need to understand we live in what's called the now and not yet of God's kingdom. Jesus came to earth and he said, God's kingdom is arriving now here on earth. That's why Jesus went around preaching. That's why Jesus went around doing signs and wonders and miracles. It wasn't to just get people's attention so that they would follow him. 
He was doing those miraculous and out of this world things so people could see that God's kingdom actually was coming. It wasn't this far off thing. It wasn't this someday promise. God's kingdom, his rightness, his power, his order, his shalom, it was coming sooner than what they had thought. And all of the signs and the miracles they were saying, see, this is it. God actually is here. Now, he wants us to be about that today. But here's the question. For us to ask ourselves, have we allowed the disappointments connected to the not yet of God's kingdom stop us from believing that God is preparing and going to do and is doing greater things? And it's so easy in this place that we've been in to just kind of be content with the not yet of God's kingdom. Someday it'll get, someday it'll happen, someday it'll happen, someday. And we kind of just kind of, because it's, it's risky and it's freaky to live in the now believing that, God, you're going to do a miracle and I've been praying for 10 years and it's not happening. That's like feeling foolish. But yet Mary, she went ahead anyway. So there's a new confidence and trust that God is calling us to. Good. The third, third thing is a kingdom generosity of heart and of hand. And as we go, this John three seventeen, it says, God didn't go through all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. And this is, you know, a kingdom generosity of heart and hand. There's been a lot of pointing of the finger, <laughs> declaring what's wrong yeah. in the last couple of years, hasn't there? Yeah. Like, man, we're all becoming professional finger pointers. <laughs> but this is, not what the, this is not what the purpose of the church is. The purpose of the church is, is to be a, a, a kingdom of generosity, of heart and of hand, and uh, to be a part of putting the world right again. Just like the mission of Jesus, it was to put the world right. It's a, it's a community of love. love and love is, love is moving towards the mess. Yeah. <laughs> with an open hand and an open heart. And uh, there's lots of mess to move towards right now. Just take your pick. I thought that was funny. <laughs> and John the Baptist, he described how this would happen. He described how this greater would happen through his life. And this is what he said, John 3.30, he said, he, speaking of Jesus, he said, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He knew that the, the, key, the, the key to Jesus becoming greater it, in, or, or for God to move greater in his life was for actually for him to become lesser and for Jesus to become greater. And, and uh, John 3.34, where he said, this is John the Baptist, he said, the one that God sent speaks God's words, and I don't think he rations out the Spirit in bits and pieces. The Father loves the Son extravagantly, and he turns everything over to him so he could give it away, a lavish wow. distribution of, of gifts. And, you know, what God does in his church, it's not just for our church. Right. What he does is so that we have something to give away to the world around us. So that we can, we have, he gives us love so that we can have a love that's greater yeah. than ourselves to give to others. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance of heart and hand. It's got, church, church is a balance of what we get out of it and also what we give into it. Yes. And because and we come because we're getting something out of yes. it. Like, we wouldn't come if we didn't right. get anything out of it. But it's not just getting something out of it. Right. It's also giving something into it. Yes. Because every, every healthy relationship is not one person who right. just receives all the time. Right. It's, right. It's, it's a balance of giving and receiving. That's what makes it healthy. That's what makes church healthy. When there's this balance of we're receiving, but we're also contributing. Yeah. We're giving. And in, in a time where our whole planet seems to be pulling inward and, and uh, you know, it, it's we're, we, this, this focus to just be, uh, you know, self-focused, like, all, it seems like never before. Like, just this, it's all about, you know, I just need to be my healthy self or my healthiest self. Like, there's a lot of self-talk yeah. right now that's going Look, like in my personal opinion, it's it's actually bordering on wow, it's way past the line. It's narcissism. 
It's, it's an obsession with how I feel and how I am. And it's like, I'll, I'll just tell you right now, it's like there's times you do the right thing whether you feel like it or not. Yeah. Yes. You know? Yes. There's lots of days we don't feel like getting up and going to work. Yes. You feel like hitting the snooze button 15 more times. <laughs> but the, the, there's a, a word, what's my point even on this? And it, it's in a, in a time where like the, the trend seems to be just being very self-centered. The, the church, we, we can respond differently. We can be outward center. We can, and it's not that we just ignore ourselves, but we're, there's a part of us that recognizes that the healthiest version of me is a version that serves. Yes. Is a version that contributes. Yes. And it's a version that helps. Yes. And that's an, an extension of our heart, but also the extension of our hand. And that's, that's extending our hand to our community. And it's partnering with God in this statement where Jesus it said he came to put the world right, right again. He came to be, and we, it, you know, the three sayings, the three sayings of city life are we spend time with Jesus, we become like Jesus, and we carry on the mission of Jesus. This is the carrying on the mission of Jesus. We've been called to help put the world right. Yes. We've been called to be a part of, of setting things right. And, and you say, well, you know, well, I made a suggestion to the church to do this. And they didn't do it. It's like, you're not getting it. It's, we don't need a suggestion box filled with suggestions about how to make things right. You are the suggestion box. You're part, you're part of the making things right. Yeah. And it's the, actually the job of the church isn't actually to make things right. The job of the church is to equip you yeah. to go out and make things right. And so, you know, people say, well, the church needs to do more to help these people. It's like, that's your ministry. Yes, it's good. That's your job. This is like, if, if it's in your heart, you're, that's, that's called Jesus speaking to you. <laughs> I don't hear God's voice. Oh, yes, you do. You're just a professional God's voice ignorer. <laughs> because, because it means work, doesn't it? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's uh, some of you, it's businesses that are going to just be kingdom relation, re revealing businesses to the world or, yes. around us. Some of you, it's going to be, you're going to be involved in the community, in programs, in, in children's clubs, in adult clubs, in addictions clubs. Yes. It's, 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 that's where we're called. We're called to yes. go from here and help make things yes. right. Yes. yes. So good. All right. Number four, two more and we're done. Number four. I believe God's giving us an invitation, all of us, everyone say, this is for me, and to have a tenacious commitment to the next generation. There was a man once that came, he has, his son was very sick, and he heard Jesus was close by. And he went, in John 4, it says, the man went and asked that Jesus come down and heal his son, who was on the brink of death. That's pretty desperate, hey? Jesus put him off. Jesus is really a little bit different than what we think he is, isn't he? <laughs> Here's a man, his son was on the brink of death, and Jesus put him off. Unless you people are dazzled by a miracle, you refuse to believe. But look at the court official. The court official wouldn't be put off. Come down, it's life or death for my son. And Jesus simply replied, go home. Your son lives. The man believed the bare word Jesus spoke and headed home. And on his way back, his servants intercepted him and announced, Your son lives. Now, two, there's just two different levels of this whole story. It's crazy. I wish we could go length into both, but we won't. But you know what? Here again, we see Jesus. He seemed to be saying no, but he wasn't. But the man was just, man, he was dogged for his, his kid. He was so tenacious. He's like, I am not going to let up. You need to come through for my kid. You need to come through for my son, Jesus. And you know what? The man sought Jesus for his son. And this is something that has marked City Life right from the very beginning, is a passionate commitment to making sure the next generation comes through, not just stronger, but that we set the platform so that they can go higher. 
so that they can do better, so that they can be stronger. And you know what? We're already seeing that. We're seeing our our kids, and there's such an excitement. Man, if you want to serve in an exciting team, Voltage. The place to be, all of the teams are exciting, but man, the voltage and the preschool rooms and our nursery rooms where we are seeing our next generation, our teens that are starting to really encounter God in a powerful way. And here's the thing that I know about generations of solid faith and serving God. There is a generational power that increases with every generation of faithfulness. Some of the most crazy, powerful ministries that even in the world today, people that are seeing, some of the churches that we know of that are seeing miracles, that people that are like, have death sentences, God healing them, people having mental health issues and diagnosis, people being healed, they're coming, it's, it's, there's, it's through churches where there's this legacy of faith. It's the generations. And I want to encourage us, church, that we have this same kind of tenacity for the next generation, praying them through, encouraging through, and believing that God, I mean, you know what, wherever your kids are at, whether you've got kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews, you've got friends that have kids, that we would have this commitment to really seeing God. We want to see the next generation come through and experience something even greater than what we've experienced. Amen? Amen. 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 And this last one, number five. And this is one that I really get excited for because I can honestly say I have never felt faith for this last one like I have in this last season. Number five, I believe God is inviting us to ask, seek, knock, and believe for miracles like we've never seen before. And there's a statement, Mark Batterson, he's a pastor and author, he said, maybe we underestimate our freedom in Christ. Maybe it's not just freedom from sin. Maybe it's the freedom to do the extra dimensional or the supernatural. And just even when I'm saying even now, talking about signs and wonders and miracles, there's so many I know in this room and so many even watching. You're like, yeah, but I never got mine. I never got mine. I never saw it. And you're very much in the not yet of the reality of God's kingdom. And you know, we heard Peter's powerful story. It was so powerful. Thank you, Peter, for sharing that. And I remember those six days because I was there every single one of them. And some of you were too. And we prayed. And we prayed. And we prayed. And it seemed like Jesus said no. It's not time. But here's the thing. We are not products of this world alone. And see, part of having miracle and signs and wonders, believing faith, is believing that God did answer. It's just in a space I can't see right now. It is as real as this ground, as this chair, as the air that I'm breathing in my lungs. As the person that you're sitting beside or holding right now. See, that's the difference between signs and wonders and miracles and having believing faith and believing that the now of God's kingdom is here, present right now. But just because I don't get to experience it with my eyes and my hands and my ears doesn't mean it's not real. It just means it's in a space waiting for me and I'm going to experience it for eternity. If I don't lose faith and I keep following Jesus and keep praying and keep believing and I pray again when there's another opportunity to believe for the impossible. See, over the last two years, I was praying for a miracle for a very close friend. 
Someone who in a season where there were a lot of changes in relationships, God brought a very special gift into my life. Except that miracle wasn't answered the way I was hoping it would be answered. Because I would have liked a lot more time with her in this side of eternity. But I know she's as real and alive and she is experiencing a greater than miracle right now because she's in eternity. She's in paradise. She's in heaven, not a far off space, but she is alive and present right now. I just don't get to experience her face to face right now. But the fact that all along the way, we got to see some incredible miracles. But that stirred in me something to say, oh man, devil, you're not gonna get me to think that that was a wasted miracle. That was not a wasted prayer. Those are never wasted prayers. Those are never wasted asks. Those are never wasted believing. It just makes me even wanna pray harder and more for greater, crazier things. Because I know what you get. You get 100% of what you don't pray for. That's 100% of nothing. But church, we're going to see miracles. We're going to see miracles. I'm sorry. I was preaching. You're gonna, you can cause. That's pretty good preaching right there. It's getting worked up. <laughs> we all. It's a great. We all. Can I read the last one, the Andrew Denton one? Yeah, read it. <laughs> we all want miracles but we don't want to be in the de desperate situations that need one. Yeah, and the, another quote here from Mark Batterson, too often our prayers revolve around asking God to reduce the odds in our lives. We want everything in our favor, but maybe God wants to stack the odds against us so we can experience a miracle of divine proportions. Yes. You know, how often do we just pray for everything to be safe and comfortable? Versus how often do we pray, God, put me in a situation where you are my only path out. I don't pray those prayers. <laughs> I've experienced some of the answers to those prayers over the years, but I don't like those situations. Ephesians tells us God has already prepared the works for us. We don't have to go make up stuff to do. God's got it waiting for us. You know what he's waiting from us? He's waiting for us to start walking into them, to say, Lord, we'll be those hands and feet to this generation. Every generation has to make a choice. Will we choose to put our confidence in God, choose to trust God, or will we choose to be safe? Will we choose to be comfortable? Let's lean in yes. and grab a hold of God's best in this season ahead, in these years ahead. You know, the world around us is saying the church is outdated, the church is disappearing. And the, the truth is, the, tr the, tr the truth is the church is doing greater on planet Earth than it has yeah. ever done yeah. in its history of the church in 2,000 years. The global church is growing faster and stronger than it has ever grown in history. And I want to encourage you, don't let a narrative of the world around, don't let Egypt tell you what yes. God's story yes. is happening yes. on the planet. Yes. Don't let spotlights on blemishes. Yes. You know what it's like? The, you pull out the magnifying mirror at your house, ladies, and you get it three inches from the zit on your face, and you go, oh my God, I'm so ugly. Well, guess what? Nobody else has a magnifying glass. The truth of the story is that God is preparing a church as a beautiful bride. This is what he says. I am preparing a beautiful bride for myself that will stand tall without spot and without wrinkle. Now, we're going to get to experience some ironing out of wrinkles. And that's done with heat and pressure. But in the end, it's a spotless bride yes. that he's creating. Let me just conclude with this. You know, everything you've experienced in your life has been solely designed for what's coming next. 
God's never, God doesn't look back in your past. He says he, he separates you from your past and he moves us forward. And responding in faith to what God is doing is always the way forward. It's always the way forward into God's, God's best. Sometimes faith is like standing at the Red Sea and striking the water boldly. Or sometimes faith is the boldness of Peter who just said, you know what, I want to, I want to walk on the water too. Yeah. Yes. But sometimes faith is the lady who quietly snuck up on yeah. Jesus and just reached out and grabbed yes. his clothing yes. to say, I just got to touch him. I don't need a scene. I don't need to cry out. I'm just going to sneak my way in there. Or the, the man of desperate faith that says, Lord, I want to believe. Help me with my unbelief. That is faith. It looks different in different situations, but whatever it looks like, God will be there to meet you when you show up. Let's stand to our feet. And I want to just, I want to pray for us. If you want to put your hand on your heart, your head, whatever part needs the most work. Just say, Father, I want to follow you. I want to follow your plan. I want to follow your best. And I want to do the work of setting things right. Would you help me to even set my own heart and my own head right so that I can follow you. And I want to believe your word for my future. And I don't want to believe the story of the world and the story that the world tells me about my future. I choose to believe you and follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc slash next step or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor to play a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to connecting with you soon.